10 Amazing Facts About Venice As one of the most famous cities in the world, everybody knows something about Venice. You'll probably be more than aware that this historic city of canals is built on a group of 118 small islands, each connected to one another by more than 400 bridges. While you'll also know that Venice is a historic cradle of culture, home to the legendary Carnival of Venice and many more great festivals. But there's much more to this iconic floating city, and so in this video we'll take a look at 10 amazing facts about Venice, from the story of how the city was built, to its role as the birthplace of the word ciao, and so much more. Number 1. Boats Obviously, boats are the main form of transport in this city of canals. You won't see a single car in the historic city centre, and so boats are needed to do everything that motor vehicles do in the rest of the world. But have you ever wondered exactly how many boats there are in Venice? Well, it's impossible to pin down a precise number, but surveys suggest that there could be as many as 100,000 boats in and around the Venetian Lagoon quite a staggering number when you consider that the entire municipality of Venice is home to around 250,000 people. But what's even more amazing about Venice's boats is that they come in all shapes and sizes. You'll almost certainly know about gondolas, the traditional form of public transport that's been in use in Venice for around a thousand years. But in the modern day, gondolas are mostly used by tourists while locals have firmly adopted motorboats as their main way of getting about the canals. Interestingly, many Venetians don't even need a licence to drive their own motorboat, most powered by an outboard motor with less than 40 horsepower. But it's not just private boats that you'll see on the city's canals. There are boats in Venice for every situation, including boat taxis, large water buses known as vaporetti, garbage boats that collect rubbish, delivery boats that will bring parcels right to your door, police boats, fire engine boats and ambulance boats that race through the city with their sirens blaring, and even hearse boats that are specially designed for carrying coffins. Number 2. No cycling. Anywhere. Most major cities around the world are often trying to encourage people to take up cycling, but not Venice. Boats are of course the only way to make your way around the city's canals, but on dry land, cycling, as well as skateboarding and rollerblading, is banned everywhere in the historic city centre. If you're caught cycling, you could even be fined, but what's the reason behind this rule? Well, space on dry land, or terraferma, is in short supply in the middle of the Venetian lagoon, and as such the city's streets are notoriously narrow and crowded meaning that a bicycle speeding its way through would pose a moderate risk to people walking the streets. Even if you wanted to cycle in Venice though, you wouldn't get very far. The crowds of pedestrians are basically impenetrable, and there are so many bridges where you'd have to get off and push your bike over the canal that the experience would be fairly unpleasant. That being said, if you are desperate to cycle in Venice, it is allowed in the city's mainland districts and on the Lido di Venezia the city's slightly more modern and more spacious beach resort island. Number 3. The narrowest street in Venice We know then that the majority of Venice's streets are famously narrow. Even the main thoroughfares linking famous landmarks like the Rialto Bridge and St Mark's Square are only wide enough for a couple of people to walk side by side. There are more than 3,000 of these streets, known as Calli, which literally means narrow, to be found around Venice. But have you ever wondered where the city's narrowest street of all is? Well, that's Calle Varisco, in the Canareggio district in the north of the historic city centre. The street doesn't really lead anywhere, coming to a dead end where it meets a canal. But as it runs between the buildings, it measures just 53 centimetres, or 21 inches, in width. And as you can see, the alleyway is almost always shrouded in darkness from the buildings above, even in the middle of the day. Number 4. A History of Humiliating Public Punishments Nowadays Venice's streets are always busy with people making their way between tourist spots, shops, restaurants and houses. But historically, the streets were also the venue for a famously humiliating public punishment. Before Venice became a part of Italy, the city existed as an independent republic for no less than 1100 years, from the year 697 to 1797. 
Throughout all those centuries, the Republic of Venice was famed for its political stability, known by the name La Serenissima, the Most Serene. And this stability came in part from the rule of the Venetian Doge, the city's ruler. To maintain its high standards of serenity, the Doge's rule was often strict, and even those guilty of committing minor offences, like petty theft, were still dealt with notoriously humiliating public punishments. The most famous of these was arguably a punishment where local ne'er-do-wells were taken to the edge of St Mark's Square and stood in between the two great columns of St Mark and St Theodore. This was already a common venue for public punishments, ranging from floggings to executions and more, but the most humiliating punishment involved criminals being stripped naked here and then tasked with sprinting nearly a kilometre through the city's streets, across the Rialto Bridge and then to the Campo San Giacometto, a historic square on which there stood this monument, known as the Hunchback of Rialto. And if running naked through the busy streets of Venice wasn't humiliating enough, their punishment was marked by one final act of embarrassment, where they'd have to crouch down and kiss the hunchback, as onlookers around the square likely giggled and pointed fingers. Number five, Venice was an independent country, at least twice. Today we know Venice as an icon of Italy, but for the vast majority of history, it existed as the independent, most serene republic ruled by the Doge. It was during this period that Venice grew to become one of the world's wealthiest, most important and most beautiful cities. But the Republic eventually met its end in the year 1797, when it fell to the forces of the French Emperor Napoleon. Napoleon controlled Venice for a few months before ceding the city to Austria, who ruled it as part of their empire until 1848. In 1848, as a wave of revolution swept across what we now know as Italy, an uprising against the Austrians in Venice was led by a local revolutionary by the name of Daniele Manin, who successfully declared the independence of a new republic, the Republic of San Marco. Taking its name from St Mark, the historic patron saint of Venice, the Republic of San Marco became one of a number of newly established republics in Italy in 1848, but it was unfortunately short-lived being reconquered by the Austrian Empire just one year later in 1849. It wasn't until 17 years later, in 1866, that Venice eventually became a part of Italy, when it was ceded to the newly established kingdom by the Austrians. Number 6. The 12th largest city in Italy Venice, alongside the likes of Rome, Milan, Florence and Naples, is certainly one of Italy's most famous cities but it's also one of the biggest in population. As we mentioned earlier, just over 250,000 people call Venice home, and although that number has gradually been shrinking in recent years, it's still able to rank as the 12th largest city in the country. But the Venice that exists today isn't quite the same as the city you know from the postcards. The historic city centre, with its canals and world-famous landmarks, is only one small part of the wider city of Venice and in fact less than a quarter of Venice's population actually lives here. The rest of the city's population is scattered around the northeastern Italian coast, many living on smaller islands in the Venetian lagoon, from places like Burano to Lido and more, but the majority, about 170,000 people, actually live on the Italian mainland, in more conventional areas that are linked to the historic city centre by a large road and rail bridge but which are also more closely connected with the rest of Italy. Number 7. How the city was built As it spread onto the Italian mainland, Venice may now rank as Italy's 12th largest city, but how exactly did this unusual city of canals come into being in the first place? Well, there are plenty of legends as to how Venice was originally founded, many saying that it originally emerged when refugees fled invasions of northeastern Italy onto a scattered collection of islands in what we now know as the Venetian Lagoon. However, the lagoon at the time was a particularly swampy place, and its islands were by no means the place to build a permanent settlement, let alone a major city. As the settlement gradually began to grow in size though, more space was needed for lagoon dwellers 
and so new land was created by an ingenious technique that involved driving long, pointed logs into the lagoon floor, and then placing wooden planks and then stone on top to create new land. Millions of these wooden piles were hammered into the lagoon over the years, and it's on top of these logs that the city still exists today, providing a surprisingly stable and enduring base on which grand palaces and hundreds of tons of stone pavements have been built through the centuries. But surely wood isn't a great material to build a city on in the middle of the lagoon. After all, they're sure to rot in the water eventually. However, that's not the case as the wooden piles of Venice have not only not rotted through time, but they've actually become more sturdy, undergoing a process known as petrifaction, where they've been starved of the oxygen needed for rotting to occur, and have effectively become fossilised. This petrified wood, therefore, is almost as strong as stone, and it's allowed the city to remain standing above the water for centuries since. Though, as more and more people, buildings and weight have been added, Venice has gradually begun to sink, at a rate of about 1 to 2 millimetres a year, one of the causes of its regular floods in the modern day. Number 8. St Mark's Square used to be a field. So we know that beneath the ground, Venice is made up of millions of wooden piles, but the many spectacular landmarks of the city weren't immediately constructed when new land was created by this method. St Mark's Square, for instance, is one of the most famous points in the city, and the largest square in all of Venice. But did you know that it was originally a simple field? In the early years of the Republic of Venice, the city decided to build a great church to house the remains and relics of its new patron saint, St Mark, whose body had been brought here from its original burial place in Alexandria in Egypt. This church was built overlooking a spacious grassy field intersected by a small river. But as Venice became more famous and more and more people began visiting the city to see St Mark's relics, the Venetian doge decided that this field was to become a sprawling new square, one so beautiful and so refined that it would serve as a breathtaking symbol of Venice's power and wealth to all those who came to visit the city. Today, St Mark's Square serves much the same purpose for all those who visit, but despite its lengthy history, most of its buildings are relatively new, Renaissance-era landmarks built over the course of the last 400 years or so. Number 9. The Destruction of St Mark's Campanile One of the most famous landmarks on St Mark's Square is actually its newest of all, the Soaring St Mark's Campanile. Though a famous icon of Venice for much of its history, the bell tower that we see today is little more than a hundred years old, built back in 1912 as an exact replica of the original which had stood for centuries beforehand. Visible from across the city and the wider lagoon, St Mark's Campanile has always been a point of pride for the people of Venice, but disaster struck on the morning of the 14th of July 1902 when the tower, whose foundations had gradually fallen into neglect, collapsed entirely. It was a monumental collapse that threw rubble across St Mark's Square and even into the lagoon, as the entire tower was reduced to ruin. But amazingly, not a single person died in the incident, the only victim being a cat who belonged to the bell tower's caretaker and who was inside when it came tumbling down. Despite no human deaths, the loss of this famous city icon was still a traumatic one for Venetians, and so the city immediately set about rebuilding the Campanile exactly as it was where it was. And just ten years later in 1912, the tower that we know today was opened for the very first time. Number 10. The origin of the word Chao there are so many amazing stories that you could tell about Venice's boats, canals, landmarks and people, but the city is also commonly thought to be the origin for one of the most famous words in the Italian language, ciao. Today used both as a friendly hello and goodbye, ciao is a quintessential Italian phrase, but the story goes that it originated from the phrase ciao vostro, a phrase in the Venetian dialect that literally means your slave. How did this come to mean hello and goodbye then? Well, during the era of the Republic of Venice, people in the nation's government would often say Ciao vostro as a respectful greeting, meaning something akin to I am your humble servant, 
and so it was this courteous greeting that eventually made its way across Italy and the world to become a famous and popularly used way of saying hello and goodbye. So those were 10 amazing facts about Venice, one of the world's most fascinating cities. Thank you very much for watching this video, I hope you found it interesting, and let me know if you have any other cool facts about this enchanting city of canals.